today I'm going to show you how to do a trace monotype. Now, the trace monotype is a kind of monotype that can be created without a press. It can be created with just a palette and drawing tools and ink and paper. And a monotype is different than other kinds of printmaking in that usually it's just a one-off print, although that's also a monoprint. And a monotype is a type of print that usually there's a singular version of. There's overlaps between monotype and monoprint, of course, but usually monotype is the type of printmaking where there's not a repeatable surface of some kind. Usually it's a flat surface that's either painted on or covered with ink and um, then printed in some form. So basically all prints involve some kind of usually a repeatable matrix, but in this instance with monotypes, sometimes it's just the mostly the transfer from one surface, the, the uh, inked up palette to the surface. And rather than a press, it's the pressure of our drawing tools that transfers the ink in this instance. What's really cool about trace monotypes is that you can usually create one that's a positive just through drawing materials and you can hand print this. But what's fun is that you can begin with a single, the first trace, for example, by drawing on the back side, you'll get this lifted from the palette. But usually whatever's remaining on the palette, you can then print as well, either by hand or if you've worked on, say, plexiglass that can be used in a press, you can then pull a negative print from that. Or if you're working at home, you can try to hand print it. But usually it's a little bit easier with a, a press, I would say. Um, and you can get more consistent results. Of course, here's another example of a trace monotype I did a long time ago of pictures from an orchestra concert event that I attended. And what you notice is that there's really, there's areas that are dark and crisper than others. This has more qualities similar to a soft ground etching in that the lines are usually very soft, but it can range depending on the type of tool you end up using. So take a look and some of these areas are much softer and smudgier, almost like charcoal or a graphite stick that's been slightly smudged. So what's really nice about this medium is that it's very sensitive to pressure of whatever drawing tool you have, but also you have to be careful of pressure from your own hands. So as you're working and tracing an image or drawing an image for this process, be careful of where you lay your hands. And so, for example, there's all these little dots around the edges, and that's from where maybe I had set my fingers down to hold the paper down or brace my hand. But I can also use the same method of using my hand to create more pressure in other areas to get additional tone and variation. Also, my examples are only in black and white, but you can use just about any color of printmaking ink, whether it's something like the speedball water soluble ink, oil based ink, a kua soy based ink. And so it's there's a lot of materials you can use to create this. Some work better than others. So I'll go over that shortly. So I'm going to show you all the materials you need to get set up and how to make your own trace monotype at home. Okay, materials that you'll need. You'll need reference images to work from or you can draw from your head. Uh, you'll need a palette for inking. This can be just about any surface you can ink for printmaking. You can also work on just like a sheet of freezer paper or palette paper of some kind. If you want to print this in a press, you will want to make sure you use something like plexiglass or linoleum. Uh, you don't want to run like a sheet of glass through the press. And some videos out there will put ink directly on the slab, but I recommend having like a second sheet for rolling out the ink and making that even in advance. Just cause I have found that if I ink directly on here, sometimes there's like too much ink and it all transfers. And then that defeats the purpose of the trace monotype. So I have just palette paper to roll out my ink. So I have a brayer to roll out the ink to make sure that it's, it's flat. 
Today I'm going to use a little bit of the Speedball Super Graphic Black ink. If you are going to use Speedball Water Soluble Block ink, you'll want to use the ink retarder because this medium, you want it to be able to stay wet and typically it dries out very, very quickly. So make sure you use ink retarder. Uh, for oil-based block ink, you can use etching ink. You can use a little bit of a Kua ink. For etching ink and block ink, sometimes I add a drop of burnt plate oil or a little bit of easy wipe just to make it a little bit easier to roll out and sometimes I find that transfers a little bit better. On the flip side, in my experience, not with all Akua ink, but some of the Akua inks I have found just entirely soaks up in my paper. So I actually, for Akua Intaglio ink, Sometimes I will add a little bit of that magnesium carbonate or cornstarch to it to make it a little bit tackier. So it's closer to the, the same body as relief printmaking ink. To lay out ink, so I have a little bit of this. If you're working from a tube such as this, you'll wanna have a palette knife. Oh, one of the plastic ones is fine or a painter one or putty knife is what I usually like to use because as you see sometimes things kind of split in the tube or the can so I just kind of smooth it out. This actually looks fine. I might not add anything to this, the Speedball Professional Super Graphic Black ink. And the other materials that you will need are tape um, I prefer using tape. If I'm going to be using this in the press, I'm going to tape down the borders so that I can easily handle this without getting my fingers stuck in the area of my print. I like to leave a little bit on the edges so it's easier to peel up later. And of course, if you want to change the dimensions from what you have, you can of course tape in inside this a little bit or if you want to you know make a different shapes within you can use tape to mask it out for the, the printed version later and for drawing tools you can use just about anything to draw with um, I prefer something visible you can use anything from ballpoint pens to pencils, graphite pencils. I have like a carpenter's pencil that gives a different shape. And I have uh, one pencil that I've sharpened with an, a blade to get a longer tip. Sometimes I just like to use colored pencils. Sometimes they're a little bit softer, but usually I like using pencils over mechanical pencil is that I can have more variation in line quality. So I can kind of have more swelling and tapering lines or I can have more softer or crisp and have more variation, whereas um, a mechanical pencil usually is it's more uniform in terms of width. Uh, but you can kind of get variations in pressure, but I, I like having more, more range. But of course you can use other tools. So as I said before, you can use your hand to add pressure. I also have other tools. This is like an etching burnisher, so I can use one side to add wider strokes and another to add really sharp marks. So you can use other tools besides a drawing tool, but the downside is that you, some, you won't be able to see those marks. And lastly, you'll need a sheet of paper. I will use a thinner sheet, like a, a Reeves Lightweight, or sometimes even like a, a mixed media sketchbook paper if I'm printing by hand at home. If I'm gonna be printing on a press, I like to use traditional like Reeves BFK or Canson edition or the new Arnheim 1618 printmaking papers. But you can experiment with paper and sometimes the type of paper you have will pick up different types of mark depending on say if it has chain or laid lines on it like in a pastel paper it might pick up or absorb ink differently. So this is one area of potential experimentation you could have. Okay. So this is a Reeves lightweight paper and I'm going to use this to print on and usually it's better ink up beforehand but I'm going to go ahead and tape this down so it won't be as likely to move as I, I print. 
So I'm going to make a hinge at the top. And once I have my ink down and I lay the paper on top again, I'll tape another piece of paper at the bottom to secure it. Okay, I'm going to ink this up. start from a little bit inside the center and work my way out. This is an old brayer that's actually slightly damaged, so um, if you're in a classroom and you picked up a brayer like this, which has a low spot in the center, then you just want to be very careful about what you lay out. Now with something like this, you can actually purposely not cover the whole thing evenly, especially if you want to leave edges like this in your print. Uh, so you can take advantage of the mark of the brayer uh, to define the edges of your, your composition. And if you're working on plexi, you can take this and hold it up to the light and see where there might be defined brayer marks or where the ink is heavier or lighter. Or if you are working on plexi, maybe where there's like damage to the plexi, which means it might not ink up as well. So I'm gonna even this out a little bit, maybe add a little bit more up here. So if you have a really hard mark, sometimes um, I'll like try to feather it a little bit by lightening the pressure on my brayer. But because I also have the low spot, I'm gonna go back and <laughs> try to. Another note is if I'm not using my brayer, I always sort like this with the base on the bottom so that it doesn't become flat and I don't have a stripe. So there's a couple spots that are heavier than others. Maybe I'll add a little bit more ink, knowing that I want to take a second print. You might notice that I, I change the direction of the brayer as I go. And that's just to try to more evenly distribute the ink. So now I'm going to uh, lay the paper down and tape it. And at this point, I don't really want to accidentally like put a lot of pressure on here because that's when ink will start to lift up a little bit. Okay, so I lost footage and my cat Sherlock decided to pay me a visit and help demonstrate another way of mark making by way of walking over the print, as you'll see later. Here I taped a reference image gently to the back and traced it with colored pencil, which I think is easier to see. I also recommend that your reference images are not on paper thicker than copy paper, so your marks will come through. But you can also draw directly on the back of your paper. Okay, so I finished doing the sea monster. And my cat has left, and you can see the, the carnage, uh, so I have a lot to clean up later. So I can take a pause, and um, if I want to, I can lift this up and see what's already been put down. And if I'm careful about this, I can go ahead and put this back down. Oh my goodness, so... <laughs> wow, so yeah, you can totally see where the cat was walking around, <laughs> and there's all sorts of other things going on. So. I'm going to lay this back down and maybe just draw on it some more. It's already kind of all over the place, so I might add a couple more things here. I might go ahead and draw this as I planned, maybe with a different drawing tool, and maybe I'll add in some flying swans <laughs> at the top. Yeah, so pressure is a huge factor in this.
We're going to try this tool to lightly add in. So let's take a quick look. All right. So, okay, the this didn't turn out all that well. You can kind of see these guys. So what's interesting is down here where it cuts off where the tape is and a couple other things. So I'm gonna take a print of this and see what this looks like. For taking a print from here, I'm going to do it by hand, but before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the pieces of tape so that uh, it, I get like a cleaner, smoother edge this way for my print. And this is where making those tabs can come in very handy. Okay, so normally I would take this and I would uh, put this on a, a press that has been set for this height. Usually just set my print on top, followed by a sheet of newsprint and print that. Uh, but today I'm gonna print by hand. So I'm going to use a piece of printmaking paper. I'm just gonna hover it over here, make sure it lines up. And if you're using anything thicker than a lightweight printmaking paper, uh, or if you're using a very stiff piece of paper, I would try to use thinner paper for printing by hand. But if you are using a heavier stock of printmaking paper, Bristol board, something else that's different, I suggest dampening the paper beforehand, which is done in a lot of printmaking processes, to loosen the surface sizing so that it will absorb a little bit easier. I'm using a thinner Hosho paper, Japanese style paper. So I'm gonna use a piece of wax paper or usually freezer paper or um, mylar or something that's relatively smooth paper. And I'm gonna print by hand with, you can use a Baron a wooden spoon or I use canned goods sometimes. Oops, well, there goes my print. Or I use like a canned good, usually the sharper side. So I'm gonna start with Baron. And you can kind of do the same thing for any of these processes. I start from the center and work my way out. I usually follow northwest, east, south, and then the other compass or cardinal direction just to kind of smooth it out so if there's any air bubbles, you're working it from the center outward. And now I'm gonna work from one corner to the other. And sometimes I stand over it, I know I'm blocking the view, to make sure I get the straight down pressure from my shoulder so that I'm applying the most and most consistent pressure. If you wanna experiment with varying the pressure you use to print, that could be one way to add uh, different kinds of atmosphere or illusion of spatial depth. Trying to avoid my wet palette. So just like in the, the first print, the positive, before lifting this all the way up, I'm gonna hold it down on one side and peel it back to see the print. I think there's a lot of ink still left on here. And I think by moistening paper that would actually lift it up a little bit easier. But at this point, since this is already down, all I can really use is more pressure. So I'm gonna go back over it with more harder specific pressure. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and try. For example, if I, I can go into very specific areas to increase the pressure. So I actually like the wooden spoon the best. So you can see what a difference it makes here. Like that was just going back in with the wooden spoon. So I might do that all over. Let me just even try the, this. So a little darker than up here, still not perfect, but so I might go ahead and use the wooden spoon method just because I think that works the best for me. 
So it, it's time consuming to get a good print with this method. I can try to use this. I'm using the softer side now of my tin can. <laughs> See what that does. This is a little easier to hold than my wooden spoon. And of course there's other objects. You could try a water bottle. Anything firm and hard. So much better, but I think I'll keep going. I'm just going in a single direction, just whatever's natural with my arm movement, but you usually can get more consistent even printing if you go in small circles that are close and slightly overlap. This might end up having a streaky look to it, which might not be professional. But Let's take a quick look. Okay, so I'm a lot happier with this than I was like the first time I checked on it. And pull it up very slowly. I'm just pulling it by the corner. If you rip it up really fast, it might peel off very quickly. So there's still a lot of ink on here. So I can print this again to get a ghost image. Although it's very hard to do by hand, but you might get a little bit more. Or you can experiment. You can spray solvent or water into this and see it disperse and then print that and see what happens. Let's compare the two. So we've got our positive and our negative. Um, and so you can see where in this one there's areas that maybe aren't nearly as clear just because so much was picked up the first time. Like that goose is barely distinguishable with all the <laughs> cat footprints, but it's kind of funny to see what that the cat footprints translates to in this one, which is still kind of a, a mid-tone. So in some ways, this is really fun to play with positive and negative images. And so another thing is once this dries, you can go back and you can keep doing this on top of your prints. And so one fun way is to introduce additional colors or shapes or uh, different types of masking with tape, for example. And you can really use this as a way to build an image that, that has qualities to it that's different than a line drawing or even it makes a very distinctive mark that's uh, nothing quite like what you can get with charcoal or, or marker. There's kind of this, it really integrates like the texture of the paper and the quality of marks in a, a way that's different than other kinds of drawing, which is really fun. So go forth, experiment with different colors, different tools, different formats, different papers, and different approaches to layering images as well. And have fun. Mm -hmm.